So today we are in Barnesville, Ohio, southeastern part of Ohio. And behind me, we have the Stillwater Friends Meeting House and the Stillwater Friends Cemetery. This place is especially important for me, being a child of adoption, because this cemetery holds roughly 80 biological relatives. That's really kind of an unheard of thing for anybody, but for somebody who's adopted to find almost 80 people buried in one spot, it's pretty outstanding. Aside from being a cemetery that holds around 80 biological relatives, uh, the other importance to this is that we are standing in a Quaker cemetery. One thing that's blatantly obvious from the get-go is just how modest the headstones are. It wasn't until the mid 1800s that Quakers even started using headstones altogether. There's a reason for that. Quakers were not people who liked to put themselves above others. And because of that, for the longest time, they buried their kin with no marker whatsoever because they felt that any type of marker put their loved one above somebody else who was buried there. The Quakers soon realized, though, that if they wanted to pay respects to a loved one who had passed, it was getting difficult to find out where they were buried. So around the mid-1800s, they decided, let's go ahead and let our burials change so that we can put headstones or grave markers, but they have to be of a specific size so as not to draw attention or to elevate another family member above anyone else. And that is why you see rows and rows of headstones that are roughly the same size. I don't know how well it's going to come across on video, but you're talking about a headstone that is no more than 18 inches tall. And very rarely do you see anything other than the name of the loved one and perhaps the year that they were born and died. But that's it. There's nothing ornate. There's nothing that draws attention. There's nothing that elevates one above the other. Here we have the headstones and the gravesite of Jesse Bailey and his wife, Azimuth. Jesse is my first cousin five times removed, and he is the grandson of Micaiah Bailey, who is my four times great-grandfather. Well, the hope was that we were gonna be able to come here, my son and I, we're gonna be able to come here and find the grave of my fourth time, four times great-grandfather. His name is Micaiah Bailey. And Micaiah was one of the first Quakers to come to Ohio. The problem is, is that 
you know, you know from historical documents that he and his wife are buried here, but we don't know where. It seems that Micaiah was in that generation that didn't get any kind of a marker, although there are some field stones here. And a field stone is nothing more than a, a rock sticking out of the ground that kind of gives the locator for where somebody was buried. And that is entirely possible that he is one of these field stones, or his location is one of these field stones. But it could be that, okay, we're going to allow a burial to happen in this spot with a marker, but all we have are these rocks. That's kind of the way it is. Um, so no real luck on finding his, his plot, although we think maybe we have found it, but we can't be 100% sure. So that's going to be part of the B-roll footage that you're going to see of gravestones. That is potentially Micaiah Bailey's final resting place. Um, but now I kind of feel like I need to give you a heads up and a little bit of um, a history lesson on who the Quakers are. And yes, they are. They, not, they aren't were. Quakers are still alive and well, and number more than you may think. But I think maybe it's time to give you a little bit of a history lesson on, on Quakers, uh, where they started, uh, where they ended up. My son and I are going to take some, uh, some footage of the, the Stillwater Friends Yearly Meeting House. While we do that, enjoy this story time. The Religious Society of Friends, also referred to as Quakers, was founded in England in the 17th century by George Fox. He and other early friends were persecuted for their beliefs, which included the idea that the presence of God exists in every person. Quakers rejected elaborate religious ceremonies, didn't have official clergy, and believed in spiritual equality for men and women. Quaker missionaries first arrived in America in the mid-1650s. As they moved throughout the colonies, they continued to face persecution in certain places, particularly in Puritan-dominated Massachusetts, where several Quakers, later known as the Boston Martyrs, were executed during the 1650s and 1660s. In 1681, King Charles II gave William Penn, a wealthy English Quaker, a large land grant in America to pay off a debt owed to his family. Penn, who had been jailed multiple times for his Quaker beliefs, went on to found Pennsylvania as a sanctuary for religious freedom and tolerance. The Quakers took up the cause of protecting Native Americans' rights, creating schools and adoption centers. Quakers were also early abolitionists. In 1758, Quakers in Philadelphia were ordered to stop buying and selling slaves. By the 1780s, all Quakers were barred from owning slaves. Today, by some estimates, there are more than 300,000 Quakers around the world, with the highest percentage in Africa. From the very beginning, the Friends emphasized inward spiritual experiences rather than specific creeds. They developed radical, unique worship services and business meetings. These forms were based on a trust in the Holy Spirit and a faith that ordinary laymen were capable of receiving the Holy Spirit. Hence, trained ministers to lead a congregation were unnecessary when in essence, every man could be his own minister. Today, there are different branches of Quakerism. Some have programmed worship services that are led by pastors, while others practice unprogrammed worship like here in Barnesville. Barnesville also hosts the Only Friends School, a Quaker boarding school that accepts all children from all walks of life and teaches the Quaker values of acceptance. The school celebrates intellectual vigor, provokes questions of conscience, and nurtures skills of living in community. Only helps shape the physical, emotional, spiritual, and intellectual well-being of young learners 
who come from across the United States and the world. It's been an amazing journey for me, discovering this place with these souls. Micaiah and his wife Mary had 10 children. Their son Samuel, my three times great-grandfather, married Harriet Embry on October 23, 1833. Harriet is a direct line descendant of William Longsword, the first Duke of Normandy, son of Rollo the Viking, who laid siege to France and reigned over the northern region until 928 AD. But that, my friends, is another story. loud sounds. Yeah. Micaiah and his wife had a son, Samuel, and Samuel married Harriet Embry. Harriet is a direct line descendant to the first Duke of Norway. Let's try that again. <clears throat> really awesome thing to think of how far back the Bailey bloodline can go once you go for, you know, Samuel's son. <clears throat> myriad of people that are in your ancestral tree. The butterfly effect. If one thing would have gone just the little bit of the wrong direction. You think of your ancestral tree and the butterfly effect. So um, so this is where our journey is going to come to end in a very all of a sudden windy location. Going to be here. Makai and his wife had a son. His name is Samuel Bailey, and Samuel and his wife are not married here. Uh, very, <laughs> might be of real interest and value to you. 